I think the biggest thing is to be mission obsessed and not product obsessed. Always like be willing to reinvent what you're doing. If you don't know your why, you're not going to know what the what and how is. You need to be able to pivot and iterate as the world changes to continue to accomplish your why. If you run a business and are looking for space, we're talking two of you needing a couple of desks to hundreds of you needing a stunning new office. You need to check out Hubble HQ. They have a beautiful, easy to use website where you can find just what you're looking for. And you can book and manage your office viewings through the click of a button. You'll also get a dedicated expert advisor who can help you make the right decision and negotiate the best deal for you. Best thing? These guys won't bore you with jargon. They'll just sort you out. And I should know, I'm a happy customer. Whether your thing is stunning views or fridges full of free booze, you'll find it on Hubble HQ. So go to hubblehq.com forward slash secret leaders to find your perfect office today. Payal Kadakia is the founder and executive chairman, chairwoman even, of the rather brilliant fitness platform ClassPass. After studying at MIT, graduating to work at the management consultancy Bain, who once upon a time rejected me, Payal, not that I'm still bitter about it, it's fine, gotten over it. She had a stint at Warner Music before setting up ClassPass in 2011 with a vision for how to connect all those individual classes gaining popularity at the time in her city, New York. Since then, it's grown to become an international powerhouse. Over nine years connecting a beautiful customer experience with a clear customer need, and it's growing like wildfire. You can find it in over how many cities? 2,500. Boom. But after turning it into a business worth over $500 million, we still correct there? Yeah. Just changes every day. So we'll, exactly. we'll go, yeah, as of today, today's secret leader has stepped down to hand the CEO reins over to someone new, which is lucky for us, really, because it's afforded us the time to spend together and share the amazing story of yet another secret leader. So without further ado and further amends, Payal, if that is still your name in the process of this interview, there's a lot changing I think so. quickly. I think Good. so. <laughs> Good. Pleasure to have you here. Before we get into it, a quick fire round. So are you ready? All right. Okay. When you walked into the studio, we had a little dog here. Dogs or cats? I'm scared of dogs. So cats? Or you scared I'm of cats scared too? Of pe- I'm kind of scared of both, to scared be really pets. honest. I, bl- I blame it on my uh, my Indian parents. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> I, I didn't want to point to who who the person with the problem with the dog was, but you know, now now we know. Now everyone knows. It's an irrational fear that I'm working on. Okay, fine. So what I meant to say was dogs, cats, or humans. But I, I like fine dogs. <laughs> we'll say humans. Yoga or dancing? Dancing. Coffee or tea? Tea. Favorite book or film? The Alchemist. Oh, very nice. Is that like because you went traveling once or because you never went traveling? The Alchemist? I yeah. just read it on, on a nice uh, vacation I was on. I yeah. loved the story of having a personal journey. It's like the a book. personal legend. If you go traveling or go on holiday, someone around you is always reading, reading The Alchemist. It. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think it just gets passed around that one copy. Exactly. Everyone in the world. <laughs> um, fitness class or educational classes? Fitness classes. Good. So a good one for you, though, because I, I genuinely wasn't sure what you'd say. And chairwoman or CEO? Ooh, that's a hard one. Chairman. <laughs> and I'm like, I really, I mean, I think it's a, it's a hard decision to say chairwoman or chairman because at the end of the day, I think it doesn't matter. Yep. Gender is irrelevant. No, but I meant the position of chairman or CEO. I don't really consider myself tied to a title, so I'll just say chairman because that's okay. what I am today. Fair, fair, fair. Okay, we've got you all warmed up, which is great. So we can just get started now. For anyone that doesn't know, lives under a rock, isn't one of the 60 million classes that they've participated in, etc. Just tell us very briefly, what is ClassPass in your own words? ClassPass is a monthly fitness membership program that lets you take classes at different studios and gyms in your local area. So it's one membership and you get credits that you can use to go to a spin class, yoga class, dance class, really anytime and anywhere that you want to. Beautifully said. It's almost like you said, said it before. before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This isn't your investment pitch. It's okay. Um, but very smooth. Okay, good. Um, now, ClassPass isn't really the simple home run that some people uh, probably expect. You know, it was born out of a pivot. Am I correct? It was born out of multiple pivots, yes. Multiple pivots, even better. Um, So before we get into that story, can you just take us back a little? You mentioned, you know, maybe your irrational fear of uh, dogs comes from an Indian heritage. Like, (laughs) tell us about this Indian heritage. What was your upbringing like? So my parents immigrated to the U.S. in the 70s. And, um, you know, I was born in the 80s. But during that time, I was born and raised in a small town in New Jersey. Education was the most important thing to my parents. You know, every decision they made 
revolved around, you know, me and my sister being able to get into a good school and have stability and make sure we did our homework. And that was 100% their focus. And it really instilled a great discipline into who me and my sister were. And the other big part of my life was I started taking Indian dance classes at the time with my mother's best friend, uh, my Ushanti. And she became sort of this coach in my life that obviously taught me to dance at a very young age, but was really giving me a way of life and a way to think about the challenges that lie ahead. Can you elaborate on that? As I know this is going to be hard for you to digest, but not as an Indian woman growing up. Um, (laughs) Really? (laughs) I know. Everyone, calm down. It's uh, it's actually a shock for everyone when they first hear that. But understanding what you mean, how dance can teach you for the road ahead. Because, you know, that's a very specific philosophical mindset. Um, And you hear there's a lot from people that find a real passion when they're younger. But that's a very hard thing for your regular Joe to understand what that could even mean without the context. Completely. I think it's so important that we find, you know, passions in our life because it gives us something to work towards. And, you know, in those moments where you're in a challenging point, right, and or you can't do a dance step, for example, I think I learned, wow, if I keep working on this, I like, you know, take it home, keep doing the step, I can actually learn, you know, learn it and get to it and overcome something. So I think it's those small mini challenges that you're put through in accomplishing and sort of fulfilling your passion that we should all never really lose in our lives. But I think because I, you know, once again, I learned that at such a young age, it gave me a confidence over my ability to get through things, right? And to be able to say, okay, if I give this focus and give this time and work really hard at it, I'll end up on the other side. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that was, you know, one of the big lessons that I learned. I think the other the other things were, you know, I, I learned to dance with a group of women. Um, so I think I also learned a lot about teamwork and this idea of how it's about all of us. Like you know? a synchronicity. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, especially as you, you know, run a bigger company, all of that, I think you really have to understand, you know, how people's strengths are together, how they move together, how they work together. And I got to, you know, I got to really experience that at a really young age. Um, so that was also a really important part. So basically like teamwork and I guess grit or resilience like exactly. along the way. Yes. Okay. As obviously as well as culture because that's a really big yeah. part of who I am. So, you know, you started in 2011, right? And at the time, that was Clustivity, correct? It was actually Dabble now. Dabble? Wanna, Dabble. Dabble. Oh, really? Yeah, that was our first name. Interesting. Okay, so did Dabble start in 2011? Yeah, Dabble started in okay. 2011. So take me to 2010. Okay, so I was working at Warner Music Group at the time. Um, I had... I had been working there actually for about two and a half years, and I actually had built also my first startup, which I consider to be my dance company at the time, which taught me a lot about being an entrepreneur because I think you I took did a lot that of, whilst you were at Warner Music. Yeah, right? it was and my then side hustle. They, they were cool with that, or they didn't know. I mean, everyone they, has a they side hustle. Knew. It was a side hustle, you know. And I think um, it was interesting because actually one of my favorite moments was uh, a year before, you know, about in two thousand and nine. My dance company, which I just, like I said, was doing on the side with a group of friends, we ended up in this huge dance festival and ended up on the cover of the art section of the New York Times, which is like for any dance company or any performing arts company, it's a huge deal. And my boss saw it and he, I remember the next day at work, said to me, you know, I didn't know if you were going to come into work today. Like, I think he was like, what are you doing here? But it's kind of this interesting thing where I think I I was always just really focused on the time I had. And I cut a lot of other things out of my life. Like everyone knew it was like work and dance. And there was nothing else kind of going on in my life. I sacrificed everything else because I knew it was so important to me. And so I had built this, you know, the dance company. I, you know, we had sold out a lot of shows in the middle of New York City, which taught me a lot about just marketing, hiring people, leading, getting people together. And I got to this point in 2010 where I just felt like both of my lives weren't right, if that makes sense. So the dance life and artist life I was living at night and on the weekends somehow felt inauthentic. And then my job at work felt inauthentic because they didn't know, you know, the other side. I wasn't being my true self. It's interesting because for a lot of people, that moment, the decision to move out of a professional job, it's just so difficult, uh, even without the parents and the friends and everyone else telling you that you're crazy, that a lot of people just don't get past that moment, right? You go to events and people talk about they're going to start a company and stuff. But when you ask what they're doing, they're actually still still in their job. job. And a year later, they still are. And I hugely relate because I just remember how difficult it was, like 
That's actually an important part. Like, I remember I did build, you know, a little financial model. I mean, the good thing about honestly spending my life just dancing and working is I spent no other money. So I saved, you know, I had six years worth of like a good salary from my from my jobs that I had saved. And, you know, I always think about why I was saving. I didn't know why I was saving at the time, but it became this important moment in my life where I remember even sitting down with my dad to be like, look, like, here's how much I'm spending a month, you know, and here's what. And I remember he was even like, okay, fine, I'll give you even like, you know, a few hundred dollars a month to just support this. And I, I actually said, I was like, I need two years. Like, I want two years. I can live off of the money I've saved to do this and to really – really try this. And I think that was also a good moment for me to be able to say, like, I have a plan. Like, I'm not just going to jump off of a cliff and not know. Because I also think, like, honestly, if you – when you start out to build a company and you're focused on it, if you're worrying about other things in your life, it just distracts from solving the most important problem, which is what you're really doing with your company. And it was really important for me to, have like, not have those distractions of, oh, my God, I need to work a side job to make money and all those, you know – challenges that I think people really end up, you know, it, like I said, it takes away from the focus that you really need to be putting on your company. So, okay, t- take me on the journey up until class pass. Like, yep. what, what, were the, what were the pivots? What were the meanders? What was going wrong? Yeah. So um, between 2011 and 2013, so there's a two-year period there. Um, that magical two years you yeah. told your parents you needed the security. For- yeah, absolutely. Thankfully, we figured it out at the end. But uh, in that two-year period, we first, you know, and, you know, I, I consider this A mistake in the sense of, you know, I obviously learned a lot from it. But what we did is we were like, this product exists in other industries, like a search engine. People go on and they book these appointments a la carte. Obviously, this is going to work. And we spent a lot of money aggregating, building this, you know, beautiful site. And we actually got into this nice incubator in the middle of uh, New York City as well. Techstars. Techstars, yeah, exactly. And we're working with um, David Tisch, who's, you know, one of our earliest investors. And we were really excited about launch. And by the way, we launched in June of 2012. So this is a year and a half after I had started the company. And it was crickets. Like, literally, like, it was one of those moments you know where— why? It's because all the noise was in London for the Olympics. Of course. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly. Right. All, all the fitness freaks were over here. I should have realized yeah, at the exactly. time. <laughs> it was an interesting moment because on one side, we had gotten into this incubator program— so I had investors who wanted to chat with me. I had press articles like talking about this product. And look, by the numbers of what I could say this was, like the number of partners we had listed, number of classes, it looked successful. And this is like always brings me to this thing of there's all these false like signals of success. And I realized very quickly like I was missing the heartbeat, which was obviously revenue like at the surface level of the business working. But no one was going to class. How are you built? How does a marketplace work without volume? It doesn't. And so I remember, like, I call this the summer of buttons because I thought it was like a UI problem. Like, maybe the color of the button is not right or it's not big enough and people aren't seeing it. Because we had people kind of browsing, but they weren't going. And I remember that fall, we finally sent this email out saying, like, go to class for free. And no one went. And I just realized we've, like, approached this problem in the wrong way. And I think it took me a little bit to get to that moment. And then I think the best thing, though, I remember talking to an advisor of mine and we chatted and, you know, he was like, Pyle, you still have money in the bank. Like, it's on you to make a hard decision right now. And it was really encouraging and motivating. And I think I've learned, like, through being an entrepreneur and in a lot of these moments where you feel like the worst, the the biggest thing you have to do is actually – plunge out of it, you know, and really, it's almost like hit rock bottom as quickly as possible. So you make that hard decision out versus like let the rock bottom happen slowly because it's just time that you're wasting and money at the end of the day. How do some of the world's sharpest minds start their day? By putting their brain first. And it's not just our secret leaders who kick off every day with heights. From Stephen Fry to best-selling author and fellow podcaster Dr. Rongan Chatterjee, who give us rave reviews. So if you care about your brain's health and cognitive potential, think heights. Listeners can get 25% off their first month with the code LEADERSHEIGHTS at www.yourheights.com. 
What do you think was the fundamental problem with the way that you were approaching it? So, and to be honest, I only I can only say this now in hindsight because we figured it out. Like, I I don't think I would have known at that point. Aside from we have to like once again throw another throw another dart at like aiming for the bullseye. But we were we were just off, you know, and it's okay. But like we need to move somewhere else to kind of get closer to the heartbeat. I realize like that just isn't something that's very. People aren't motivated to go to class. They're scared, right? So to put all the brain cycles that go on into finding a class, seeing – like having the fear of, oh, should I try boot camp? Oh, it's also this expensive. Oh, I have to go get my credit card. Oh, now I have to enter in all my information. I mean that's just too many like brain cycles. And I've I've done a lot of studying of like behavioral psychology now, especially as we've like really figured this out. And it's too many brain cycles. And the second you make the ability so hard, conversion goes down, right? And I think I've learned that over and over again. And like I said, we were up against getting people off their couch to go work out. And, you know, it's just – it's not easy actually when you think about it, right? That's – most people have a really really hard relationship with that. So how do you transform that? It's so many decisions that you're putting on somebody in a matter of, you know, 10 seconds that that was – it wasn't the button at the end of the day. It was, it was that decision-making that had to happen in our customers' minds that we needed to unpack. And so after that, we started um, – there's two things we really did. We we once again, like, started thinking about the customer value proposition and making this more fun and exciting for, like you said, the more mainstream market. This wasn't for somebody who already knew their fitness routine. It was for someone who was, in a way, like, scared or just, you know, didn't even know what options were around them. And the second thing is, is we actually went and finally, like, really went and talked to our partners. I know this sounds strange, but it had been, like, a year and a half, and we really hadn't talked to the class partners. We were kind of behind technology, right? We were we kind of just thought we could build this screen and people would book and we didn't necessarily need to fully interact with, uh, with our partners' businesses. And probably getting excited as a marketplace, like having to assign volume of them, otherwise you don't have a business. So then you're not really investing in the quality of those relationships, exactly. just that there has to be the names, the yeah, numbers. Yeah, we were like, oh, we can like get anything. this data, we can scrape it, you know. And and I look, once again, I've, I, I say this in a way for like a lesson for anyone who's building, you know, a customer-oriented product is and someone that has like real life people on the other end like our partners is you need to really understand both sides of the marketplace because technology just can't fix it right if you can't fix this behavior in real life the chance of doing being able to do it via technology is zero and so with that mindset actually as we started building this product literally we were so scrappy so after like a year building this like high-tech booking platform we were doing all these reservations manually, like literally like the second a reservation would come in, um, which finally they were coming in, like an email would come to, you know, our our info at, you know, classivity.com address. And one of us would go and make the reservation in the system. Like it was a very, very like, you know, just manual process. And we learned so much about both sides of the business by doing that a little manually. So I, I do think like to understand sometimes you kind of just really need to make sure you're getting in there because you we would have lost so many of the insights that we had during that time. So at the time you started, you were a single founder, correct? Uh, no, I started uh, my company with uh, my co-founder, Sanjeev Sangavi, who was one of my childhood friends who was super, you know, passionate about the space as well. Okay, take me through that then. So there's there's two of you, you mentioned there's four at this point. Yeah. So who are the people in the office? How do you find them? And what's the journey from the first four to the first 20? It obviously depends on like what skills you have as a as a founder. You know, I think you have to always really make sure you're very, very clear with like what you know how to do versus what you don't. You'd already covered physics, dance, geometry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's all I could do. Though. Yeah, psychology. I'm like really good at a few things I'm good at. But so, you know, obviously I needed a technical person. So um, got a technical, you know, a C our CTO who was actually once again a childhood friend that actually we all had known. Um, with somebody who, and he's actually still at the company, which is incredible, at the Lori. He really, you know, got in and started building the product for us. And he was a key hire because obviously there was no way to build a product without him. And then we also had someone on the marketing side, Mary Biggins, who um, joined the company. And she also, like, had a great marketing background. So she was helping with a lot of the sales and marketing at the time. So we kind of all, like, split up tasks. But at the end of the day, I think in the earliest days, you want generalists, if that makes sense, but passionate generalists. Your current CEO mm -hmm. came in later, is that right? Fritz, uh, right after... Now, Fritz doesn't sound like he grew up in your Indian part of New Jersey. Fritz Lenman, no. Yeah. We actually look like exactly opposite people. <laughs> like, if, it's actually really funny. He's like a tall white guy, and I'm like a really short Indian girl. So <laughs> we're like in complete different um, realms. Kind of like Arnie and Danny DeVito in Twins. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's us. <laughs> Okay, so where did you guys meet? So um, David Tish, actually. So right when um, 
I realized like ClassPass was working, you know, I mean, it was this amazing moment. Obviously, finally, after, you know, three years, you're like, you have a product that works. So um, actually, just on that point, yeah. what, what does working feel like yeah. to you? Because you're probably a perfectionist, really hard. Just telling my team the story, actually. I literally got five emails from customers telling me their experience on the on this product and how it changed their life. And the way they told me it changed their life was always the product I wanted to create. And until they said it, I don't know if I would have ever known that I was goal-seeking that, per se, but it was not data. Like, it, it was a really important moment because my data could have led me in, in some direction of it working, but it was that truth and, like, that authenticity of the customer experience that we had built for these folks that I knew we had hit it right on its head. And I think because it's so easy whenever – and we only had 100 customers at the time. And everyone's always like, oh, is it – like, did you have thousands, you know, to know it worked? No. I didn't need that. Like, and it, this is after, by the way, like, three years of pivoting um, where I did have places where I had thousands and millions of, like – not millions, but thousands of email addresses at the time, you know. And it was – it came down to these customers having the experience I always wanted to build in their lives because of this product. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And, and like, you know, how do you use that story internally? Like, is, is, part, is it like part of your culture? Like, do you have a, a system where these sort of emails come in and you get to sort of share them around the team? We celebrate our customers all the time. And I think, you know, what's so amazing is like when you meet the ClassPass customer and all of our employees use our product and you meet people at class, they all have this ethos of of knowing that they appreciate this time in their life. They are enjoying this product. And it's our true north. Like our vision statement is every life fully lived, which means life is an inspiring life and you're using your time wisely and doing the things that you love, which is really at the core of, like I said, those letters we received were that. It was like people being like, I have confidence. I've never, you know, I've never enjoyed working out before. Like it's made me stronger. Like I got a promotion at work. It was it was actually like it it had nothing almost in a way to do with the physicality of what happened to their bodies. It had to do with the emotional and mental like strength it gave them. Going back to everything I just talked about with dance, mm. that was what I always wanted to give people. It's like this methodology to be able to keep improving your life. You know, an unintended uh, consequence potentially anyway. I know you're in London now, but like as, an in, as, as someone who like regularly goes to California, um, I always use ClassPass every time I went to America because, you know, you're not going to sign up for a gym. And, like, what, and so it was like, a really niche use case, which I would never build a business on. It was incredibly handy for me. A lot of and, our customers do yeah, that. Yeah, and like a lot of my friends as well. Like it was friends that recommended that I did that when I went out to the States. And that's such an, a useful thing to have. Yeah. When did you launch in the UK? Because I'm speaking about this from a UK point of view. It was uh, I feel like March been... of 2015. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. I was about to say, I feel like I've been using ClassPass for like four or so years. But, yeah, that, but, exactly. that, but, but it was over in the States. So I was like, I wonder when it would have like, it was you know, got into my It was our first international market that was that? we okay. launched. Yeah, and that was actually right after we launched our $40 million Series B. Right, okay. Yeah. So, I don't know like, how I sometimes remember all this. Like, it, I think maybe I've told the story, but I literally am like, it was so specific. But it's I actually, like, I, I remember the exact day we came out here. It's the numerate Indian upbringing in you that's remembering all the details. The details? Yeah, for sure. Eating all the almonds, yeah. Yeah, definitely all the almonds, yeah, and the turmeric. Okay, so in terms of handing over the reins and moving into a new role, um, how's that felt? Because... I guess more specifically, like one of the really interesting things you go through as an entrepreneur in your journey at different stages is sort of decoupling the ego from the company and from the challenge at the time. So, yeah. and that's always quite a difficult thing. Like if you've got the um, humility to change enough, then you end up going on phenomenal journeys. But then moving out of a certain role and into a new one is, you know, is a quite a special, I mean, it says a lot about you, which is, yeah. uh, in my opinion, an extremely positive thing because you've got the company's success in mind. But how did that even come up in the first place? Was it internal discussions, external, a whole mix, been on the table for years? You know, I never started my company to be the CEO of a big company. Like, that's never what I cared to do. I just wanted to make an impact in the world. That was, like, the, always the first thing. And I, like, I was actually was really clear about that. I was, you know, and I was like, the second I don't want to be doing this because I'm not enjoying it, I'm not going to do it. And I think, like, that's just an important mindset to have in life on anything you do. And I've always let let that really guide me versus forcing myself to do things that didn't feel right to me. And at some point, I just started feeling like the title of CEO took over my day job and like what I was working on. And it's so different than what you feel as like a founding CEO and you get to focus on your customers, your product and the vision, all of all of that. I felt like I was getting bogged down in that. 
And I was, you know, I wasn't adding value to the company. I kind of knew I had to as like a founder and where the company was going to go. Um, And so, you know, I think I think the second and the only way I could have done this, like once I realized that was by finding the right person. And I think that is the hardest thing. And usually it's it's really hard to do that, to be honest. And I think it's not an easy thing to find someone who understands your vision, who gets your culture, gets your vision, understands your team, and is also going to work with you, right? Like, I think it's like always a hard thing when you're like, okay, when someone else is sort of like making decisions, how do you also know you're going to work with that person well to continue to move in the direction that you want to go? And so I was just really lucky that I knew somebody. And I remember when I called Fritz and I was like, you have to do this. And I had actually asked him a few times, to be honest, like through this journey, to be like, hey, like, what do you think about that one day? You know, and I think it's just like the time and the moment just happened. What was he doing up until that point? What role? He was like he was chairman. And so he would basically operate on the board like he would once again, like we would talk through business strategy a lot together. And he had been investing in a lot of other companies. He had some other entrepreneurial things he was doing. So it almost sounds like it's a really interesting, like, dating strategy. Like, you're kind of trying to date the right co-founder, right? As in, you're trying to find the right person. There's no real right way or wrong way. You kind of just have to sort of feel it out, see if it works over a period of time. What do you think, like, drew him to you? Like, culturally, that's so, you know, different to the other opportunities that he had in front of him. Yeah. You know, from the, like I said, that first meeting we had, and this is a good question. I wish, like, he was here to answer it, but um, I'll, I'll speak for him. Uh, can you do his voice, please? I, sometimes I can. We sometimes finish each other's sentences. Go on, try, 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 and, do, try and do his voice. Um, like, We've got Fritz with us in the studio. He's hello, just popped I'm in. I'm Fritz. No, I can't do that. He does not sound like that at all. I only can do one accent, which is like an Indian accent, which is terrible. Do you want to do so your impression do, of Fritz if like, he was Indian? I, I would I would <laughs> not. It's going to be really bad. But, you know, going back to when I met Fritz, you know, I think he really believed in this. And and most importantly, he really believed this could change people's lives. Like, I think he, while he obviously saw the money and the value in it, I think he truly believed in the mission that we were creating. And he heard that. And I think through the process, because we were actually probably one of the first companies he, you know, raised that much money for, like from, you know, people that he knew, et cetera, and helped sort of really like lead the Series A. I think he felt like he was a part of it, you know. So I think like part of him had always felt like he was closer, like in depth with the company from the beginning. Um, so I don't think I think it was just a matter of if it was the right timing and when, you know, as we were talking about earlier for him to really take it on. Sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to tell you guys about the team I use for hiring tech talent, the amazing LaFosse Associates. They're specialists at finding the best people in technology, digital and change management. And they have an incredible program that takes leadership teams through pre and post funding recruitment and scaling headaches. I know you know what I'm talking about. So if you're looking to scale a tech team, you need L-A-F-O-S-S-E dot com. Now back to today's secret leader. When it comes down to divide, I'm not going to get specific, so don't worry. But when it comes down to things like dividing equity and understanding ownership in mm-hmm. a company, and especially in the early stage, you know, you're a really early stage founder, you put two years into a company, you've tried a bunch of things as pivots, as early money from someone like David Tish, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Do you just feel like unbelievably confused about what the right thing is, the wrong thing is, if people are asking for reasonable things, like who do you even turn to? How do you know if oh, it's yeah. fair? This is, so um, I always actually remember this moment. So during the time, actually around the time I was raising my seed round, um, I don't, are you guys familiar with ZocDoc here? Like it's a, it's a huge, uh, it's a big like doctor, uh, open table type of service, but for doctors. Okay. Um, and similar. it's in the US. So Cyrus Masumi, um, you know, he was the CEO. He was, I, like, seeked him out to become an advisor to uh, me and the company, and he was. And there's no way to understand every term in those term sheets, you know, like, until unless you've really built a company before. And my biggest thing is, was, I remember when I was reading it, I was like, how do I know that this is going to come back and, like, kick me in the ass or not? Like, you just don't know, right? Like, there's all these terms. I read this one book uh, called Venture Deals at yeah, the time. brilliant, by the way. Yeah, it was a really great yeah. book, which I think helped me really work through the terms. Because you don't know. And to be honest, that summer when I had all these brilliant term sheets from, like, good VCs, the number one thing I, I just felt, I was like, all these term sheets literally are are documents of, like, all the doubt, if that makes sense. Like, mm. it's like when stuff starts going wrong, here's what's going to happen. You know, like, everything is actually sadly, like, betting on something not working out. Yeah. And I kind of, like, I just, you know, once again, I as you probably can tell, I just don't like feeling constrained in any way. Like, I like the freedom to, you know, breathe, to take a risk, to be able to do, you know, the things I want. And so I think you have to get very clear on, like, which terms 
are really going to affect you. Uh, and everyone is different. Every company is different. Every founder is different. I remember like just having to study it, you know, and ask a lot of questions to other entrepreneurs because you don't know you don't know all the ways that no offense, like these terms can screw you at the yeah. end of the day. And when someone gives you a nice like standard term sheet, I mean, by the way, I just always say like there is no standard term sheet. Like when people come and say like here's the standard, there. I mean, hopefully you have the leverage to be like I'm not taking a standard term sheet, but you just have to you know learn to ask for that. Well, it's also that most people that go in for venture capital fundraising the first time around don't understand how venture capital fundraising works. So they're misaligned with the type of investment that it is. Right, right. So it's like, well, you want me to go how fast and make those decisions how quickly? And that doesn't work for me. It's like, well, then why are you in a VC? Right. Which is understandable the first time around. You don't, you just don't know. Yeah. That book is obviously an incredibly helpful um, Way to navigate that. Yeah. I think the other thing I realized is like the person who invests in you and like knowing their role within – the partnership of, you know, the venture capital firm is really important. Like how many deals that do they have that have succeeded? Are you like one of the first, like which fund are you in? Are you, are they betting on you? Just to know, because it gives you actually a sense of, once again, like the timeline you're on in a way for that person and like how much of their career is, is essentially rooting on you. I think it's really important that you understand that dynamic as well. You, you tend to find the best VCs and the best investors in general are the ones who say, you know, here's a list of all the people I didn't invest in or here's a list of the uh, companies that failed. Here are their founders. Speak to them and see how I dealt yeah, with them. That's absolutely. like a really good litmus test for it. OK, jumping forward a little bit beyond all of the fundraising. Is it fair? Is it not? You've grown the company exponentially now, so much so that my most recent research was just debunked as uh, 50% of the actual numbers, which means that, you know, by tomorrow, they'll be double up again, um, naturally. Are there more plans for fundraising or anything like that? Is that like in your in your plans or is it at the moment, you know, you're just growing so fast, you're focused on? I mean, we just closed, you know, we just raised our Series D last year. Um, we did $80 million and heavily really focused on geographic expansion at the moment. So we're now even here in, you know, the UK, we're in five different cities, uh, Brighton, Bristol, Manchester, Edinburgh, and London, which is incredible. And then we're also in, um, as I mentioned, 2,500 other cities, massively global at the time, um, 15 countries and counting. So it's one of those things where I think we know the product works and it's about really, you know, getting, making sure we have you know, the breadth of all the people in the world who can actually do this. And are there lots of, um, are, you like surprised, are there like competitors just popping up that you just like are surprised by, if that makes sense? As in, I'm sure in the early days, there were always competitors that are just irritating. And you're like, well, you know, I, I came up with it first or I'm doing it better. But like now are you more surprised? Are there competitors that are even bothering to try and take market share? Well, it's Well, you know, actually, let's rewind this a little because I think the competition point is an important one from the beginning. And I think, you know, a lot of people f have competitors out there. Um, I think, first of all, like in the earliest phases, I've realized like competition does not matter. It's all about execution. So when you're in like idea phase, I think if you're worried about competition, like, oh, this person's doing the same thing as me, it doesn't matter. Like until you make an impact, it doesn't matter. Then you can make an impact. And even when we figured it out and, you know, announced our $12 million uh, Series A, we then started seeing copies of, you know, the ClassPass model in so many cities uh, across America. It was, you know, I and I had like this motto I remember with the team. I was like, guys, like no one wins the race by looking behind them, you know, like, let's just look front. And I really tried to like keep that alive. But I mean, it got hard at some point. It was like every day. And people would literally like we would change something and like they would change their site. It was like the same color, same. And I remember then and I always say it's like maybe it was like the competitive dancer in me came out and I just was like, that's it. Like we're going after them. And I remember we just, you know, it was like feet on the street, making sure we got to all these markets. And we launched really quickly. Like we hired, um, I remember there was this one weekend around the time where we hired about 30 salespeople just in one weekend. Like we literally, I remember we had like had just had people trying to find people like on the streets a little, like in Craigslist, like, and we would make them call us and like figure out how they were on the phone because we just needed to get as many studios signed up as possible because that was how our marketplace worked. Um, so that was the earliest days. And then, you know, and I think as we've gotten bigger, I mean, the amount of scale we have now from a, especially from a, like a data and technology perspective, is just no one can really compete with that. There are competitors in like different parts of like the fitness industry, per se, going after like different pockets of money. But in terms of like what we've been able to do, and, you know, we've seen it, it's just like no one can provide that type of service to our studios anymore. And on the customer side, it's just 
the amount of like cities and the ability of, you know, being able to access so many studios is just something that, you know, it's it's kind of hard to compete with. That does not mean you don't innovate. And I, I say that as a, you know, I believe in this day and age, if you don't innovate every two years, like someone's going to come and take you out. And so I think it's important to just make sure you stay on top of that. So as someone who doesn't look left and right as they're going full steam ahead towards uh, the end goal of total global domination, I assume, healthy domination, um, healthy for others, I guess, you know, the key question here is, you know, what about your own like mental state, resilience, like, you know, it's so up and down the whole uh, everyone's journey, right? And that's without running a business. So uh, when you're running at the kind of challenge as well, with like a localized marketplace in each city and all these things to figure out the whole time, have there just been really tough moments where you've just been like, I just, I just can't? And has, has anyone been there to help you or has, has it never really got to that level? I mean, many times. I mean, I can't. I think uh, you, at some point now, it's not that I'm numb to them. It's just They've happened so many times that I think at this point you're just very, you know, you just know they're going to happen and you learn to get back up and keep moving. I think in the earliest days when they felt like very, very, you know, harsh moments, I think people really are the ones who got me through it. I think having good advisors around you. And at the end of the day, you know, you have to believe in yourself. And I think whatever that takes, you need to find your way back to that as quickly as possible. Um, I, I definitely realized, once again, like three years into this that this was going to be a marathon, not a sprint. And, you know, I think sometimes people think like, oh, I'll just do this for, you know, once again, I said two years, right? It's it's eight, nine years later, right? So I think I realized this is my life and I love this and I need to set myself up to succeed, which means like I also needed to make sure I was taking care of myself mentally, you know, emotionally, health-wise, like in every way possible. And I remember like that moment in my life where I was like, class is never going to get to what I want it to if I don't work personally. And I think you have to make sure you take care of yourself through this process, which for me actually meant not giving up dance, <laughs> of all things. What was the worst day in your startup career? Oh, wow. Um, Other than this. <laughs> I think the the day we um, had to sunset our uh, one of like our favorite products, which was like our unlimited product, was a really hard day for me because I knew our customers weren't going to be happy with it. And it was like, you know, it was a good product that people loved. and But like at the same time, it got really tough because it was going to be priced out of, the, out of, I feel like, the accessible side of the market. And we built this for a customer that, you know, we wanted to be able to afford fitness and going to these classes. So that was like a pretty hard day for me. Is that because like morally or philosophically you felt like you just couldn't fulfill that? promise internally. I mean, you don't want to disappoint your customers, right? Like no founder, I mean, we're a customer-oriented company. No founder wants to have a day where you know your customers are going to be, you know, really upset, you know, and I just knew we had to kind of get over it to be able to get to where we needed to go. But, you know, it was it was one of those days. What are you most proud of? I am really proud of that reservation number. And I, I like, I truthfully like from like the first reservation that came into our platform and I remember like jumping for joy that like someone is going to be going to class because of us. I like truly believe that and think about that and think about like the hours of people's lives like we've had our hand in, right? And this is like think about it. We got someone to go and do something great for themselves, right? That they feel better and do. Like to me, it's such a privilege to be able to do that and like I am really proud of that that ability to be able to do that every single day for people. Uh, another question. So I hope you've got even more insights. And like, what's the best piece of advice you could give to listeners? Oh, let's see. Um, well, especially because we have a lot of entrepreneurs listening. I think the biggest thing is to be mission obsessed and not product obsessed in the sense of always like be willing to reinvent like what you're doing and like your experience, your product in line with the mission, especially with technology and marketing and everything changing so quickly as it does, is if you don't know what you, you know, set out to create and, like, your why, you're not going to know what the what and the how is, right? And you need to be able to, you know, once again, like, change those things, pivot and iterate as the world changes to continue to accomplish your why. Do you remember what your initial mission was with ClassPass and has that changed? So it obviously, I think, has broadened and evolved. I, would, would I be able to say, like, the vision was every life fully lived on day one? No. I think what I felt in the beginning was, wow, like, I've always loved to dance. And I am, you know, I'm 25 years old and I'm working and I'm still dancing. Most of my friends aren't. Like, I think I, I realized there was something in that 
in that construct, and I realized technology could solve it. I think in the beginning, it's not that it wasn't that big or I didn't feel it as as hard. As I mentioned, I didn't know until I read those letters that, like, I was looking for that sense of emotion in, in my customers. I'd realized I once I had earned that, what else I could do with it. So I think, if anything, like, I started with, like, a seed towards it, and it was still, like, towards a true north. It just wasn't as big. And I think as I've earned the right to sort of make that vision bigger— it's been incredible to be like, wow, actually, like we now like our vision statement, as I told you, is every life fully live. But our like, literally like we want to be the destination for all your free time. And so this is like much broader than being just a discovery platform for fitness classes. It starts moving outside of fitness into the other things that you could do with your time. And like that is a, you know, a very different, not very different, but it's it's like a broader goal that I feel like, or vision that I feel like we've earned. Well, the thing about a mission is it has to have some, some sort of tangible end because if you're big enough and bold enough, you reach it and then you get to change your right, mission. Right, and which then is you awesome. get to go bigger. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Okay, we're well, coming on to the end now. You'll be pleased to know. What is the weirdest or most unique thing about you? I'm 4'11". <laughs> I don't know if that's the most unique thing about me, but... I am 4'11". Most people don't don't know that, and nor do they suspect that even when they're hearing my voice, you know, but I'm 4'11". Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, you know, how people sometimes um, just don't look or feel like the cer- their certain stature, whether they're tall or small or whatever. But yeah, when I just met you, I didn't even notice. And that's exactly. not just because you're sitting down, but just as standing, you don't really come across as 4'11". You are wearing seven foot heels, though, so <laughs> that hasn't really helped. <laughs> Uh, you've, you've augmented the whole sense of reality for me. Okay, what's the one thing you do differently if you could do it all again? This is always a hard way. People always ask this. You know, and I truly, like, I, I truly believe, like, everything that happens, like, the mistakes, the failures, you know, the challenges, all were a part of the journey. As, as long as you extract information from it, like, I would say the only thing I would change is maybe, like, those moments where I did stuff and didn't extract information from it. You know, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but it's like, why do something? And I'm sure I have in my life, you know, made decisions out of obligation or just doing it because someone told me to do it. Yeah, fair enough. And um, what's what's the best piece of advice someone's actually ever given you that's really stuck with you? I, I've had a lot of great people around me. Um, I would say that my dad and and I, you know, I think he's really instilled in me. I mean, he's the most patient person in the world, and it's actually hard to be patient in the world that you're in with how you know how many things you have to handle being an entrepreneur. But I think he really always taught me that the world's always going to constantly change around you. And you just have to learn to be adaptable and flexible. And I think that's really true, especially as an entrepreneur, is don't when change happens, you know, you can't, you know, freak out or be like, no, no, no. It's actually being like, okay, this is happening. All right, what am I going to do to evolve? And once again, like kind of back to that mission I was saying and the mission and, you know, staying tied to it is you can't, the world's going to change. So, you know, don't be the person standing saying don't change, you know, move with it. Okay, final question. Okay. Let's just assume that you've 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 reached every single mission you could ever come up with for class pass. I hope that never happens. And in, in the way, well, okay, sorry, actually I hope that does happen, but um <laughs> For any investors listening, she <laughs> does hope it happens. It's just I never want to feel like it's over, you know. Well, but this is it. So if you could run any other business in the world, you know, what do you think it would be? Because at the end of the day, I'm just assuming there's some there's some inkling of some specific dance related yeah. idea <laughs> to change the world. <laughs> you probably have, yeah. So um, what, what would it be? Well, you know, just even the reason I started uh, my dance company, saw it was because um, I wanted to help share my culture with the world through dance, right? And um, the beauty of my Indian roots. So um, it would be, you know, to create like a Indian ballet. That would be the other thing I would do in my life. And I don't think anyone would bet against you to make that happen Thanks. in your spare time, most likely as <laughs> exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> with a geometrical focus. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pyle. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Hey guys, that's a wrap for this series. We hope you've enjoyed what we've put out into the universe because we've had a great time recording it. We'll be back before the end of 2019 with our next series. We're in the studio right now editing what we hope is the most valuable and useful thing we've done to date, putting together a special series of insights, all the best bits from our guests around various topics like funding, hiring, mental health and more. We're interspersing these with the recordings from our sold-out live events, which will include founders like Joe Malone and Justine Roberts of Mumsnet discussing what they'd do differently if they did it all again, or the founders of the world's largest healthcare app, Babylon, and the world's largest mental health app, Calm, discussing the future of healthcare. 
And we've even got the founders of Moonpig and Photobox discussing what it was like selling and buying one another's companies in front of a live audience. Our goal is to get amazing, unique insights from amazing and unique leaders for you to become even more unique and amazing too. We'll see you shortly. And if you can share this with at least one friend or even follow us on social, it makes all the difference to us. I'm at Dan Murray Serta and we are at Secret Leaders on Instagram. We'll see you soon. And don't forget... Tune in or you'll miss out. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this episode. It was brought to you by your host. That's me, Dan Murray Serta, producer, Rich Martell, edited by Harry Morton of Lower Street Media. And if you've heard this, it'll probably have something to do with Jennifer Osman in Canada. You'll also notice throughout this series, we've got some beautiful illustrations made for every episode. And that's all thanks to Christina Naru of smartupvisuals.com. You can check out show notes, transcripts, and our upcoming Secret Leaders live events on secretleaders.com. If you haven't yet, hit subscribe on whatever media player you use. Just follow us at Secret Leaders on Instagram or at Secret Leaders 1 on Twitter. And tell just one friend about how freaking awesome this episode is. If you want to go the extra mile, I'm at Dan Murray Serta on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we'd love to see you take some screenshots of the episode you're listening to and share it across your social media. It'll bring a tear to our eye and joy to our hearts. See you next week. Tune in or you'll miss out. 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 In 